Please bow your heads for the prayer of illumination. Our loving Heavenly Father, we ask that your word be the light in our darkness, guiding our steps this week. May the Holy Spirit speak truth to our hearts this morning and whisper the meaning in our ears as we worship you in this place. We pray these things in the blessed name of Jesus, our resurrected Lord and only Savior. Amen. Our Old Testament scripture today is Leviticus verses 1 and 2 and then 9 through 18. Listen now for the word of God. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, Speak to all the congregation of the people of Israel and say to them, You shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. When you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not reap to the very edges of your field or gather the gleanings of your harvest. You shall not strip your vineyard bare or gather the fallen grapes of your vineyard. You shall leave them for the poor and the alien. I am the Lord your God. You shall not steal. You shall not deal falsely. And you shall not lie to one another. And you shall not swear falsely by my name, profaning the name of your God. I am the Lord. You shall not defraud your neighbor. You shall not steal. And you shall not keep for yourself the wages of your labor until morning. You shall not revile the deaf or put, st- put a stumbling block before the blind. You shall fear your God, I am the Lord. You shall not render an unjust judgment. You shall not be partial to the poor or defer to the great. With justice you shall judge your neighbor. You shall not go around as a slanderer among your people, and you shall not profit by the blood of your neighbor. I am the Lord. You shall not hate in your heart any one of your kin. You shall reprove your neighbor, or you will incur guilt yourself. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against any of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. We were talking about what it means to love, and love is hard. Love is really hard because love is about being vulnerable, and none of us like to be vulnerable. But... The um, scripture that I'm about to read for uh, the Gospel of John is just really helpful, I think, because it reminds us that our love is not about what we do. Our love is about what Christ has already done for us. And so I'll be reading from the 13th chapter of the Gospel of John. And I'm going to be reading from the message. It's different from the book that you, uh, the translation you have in front of you. But um, I really like the way that it speaks about um, the message of love. And so if you'd like to follow along in your scriptures, you can. Um, but I'll be reading from the message. Listen now for the word of God. When he had left, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man is seen for who he is. And God seen for who he is in him. The moment God is seen in him, God's glory will be on display. In glorifying him, he himself is glorified, and so for glory all around. Children, I'm with you for only a short time longer. You're going to look high and low for me, but just as I told the Jews, I'm telling you, where I go, you are not able to come. Let me give you a new command. Love one another. In the same way that I have loved you, you love one another. This is how everyone will recognize that you are my disciples, when you see the love that you have for each other. Simon Peter said, Master, just where are you going? And Jesus answered, You can't follow me where I'm going. You will follow, but later. Master, said Peter, why can't I follow you? I'll lay down my life for you. Really? You'll lay down your life for me. The truth is that before the rooster crows, though, you'll deny me. Three times. This is the word of the Lord. If I say the words, like a good neighbor, what do you say? 
Day Farm is there. That's so good. I didn't even have to hum it. I thought I might have to hum it at some point, but no. So sometimes when we hear things, it triggers just um, a universal knowledge. Our text these, la- these three weeks before Lent, uh, last week, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, right? Today is Jesus' addition to that and your neighbor as yourself. Knowing the love of God by the time we are done with this sermon, I pray that we will have looked at how that compels us to love our neighbors. And it's nothing new because as you heard, it's in Leviticus. Leviticus is the Old Testament's book of order. (laughs) It literally goes through, I mean, if you read through it, it's almost as bad as numbers. It's Moses' attempt to kind of put down what it is that we're going to look like as people together under the lordship of God. But the 19th of chapter, 19th ver, excuse me, 19th chapter really lays out what that's supposed to look like. What it means to be a good neighbor. And in that you heard how you're supposed to treat the poor, how you're supposed to live justly with one another, how you're not supposed to steal. It, it really lays out all the different areas. And did you catch that you don't clean your field entirely so that the poor and the resident alien can have something to eat? It's, it's neighborly. It's hospitality. In the New Testament, Jesus doesn't abandon this in any way. In fact, he speaks about it in every single gospel. He speaks about it in the 22nd chapter of Matthew, the 12th chapter of Mark, the 10th chapter of Luke. Remember, um, who's my neighbor? <laughs> um, I don't think that guy worked for State Farm, but, you know, he was a, a lawyer. Um, and now in John, the chapter the 13th. And the reason that I, I pulled up John 13 is because John 13 adds the why. Why should I love my neighbor as I love myself? And what's so beautiful and you heard in that scripture was because you love because, first of all, Jesus loves the way God loved, the Father loved. And and secondly, because that's how Jesus has loved you. And that's why we love our neighbor in a way that, well, quite frankly, the world tells us not to do. Raymond Brown is a very, very famous um, um, Catholic New Testament scholar, particularly the Gospel of John. And he says this, It's a love that died for me. It's a love that rose for me. It's a love that extends to fellow Christians. And it's a love that passes even to non-believers. It is the goal of reaching the whole world. It's, It's really the Father reclaiming the creation, isn't it? God loved us and called us into being. Sin has separated us, so Jesus has come to show us just how loved we are so that we can show the rest of the world how loved they are so that in the end, God can reclaim this beautiful creation that he's made for us. And it's a whole love. You know, if you go to the Greek of that New Testament text, four times he speaks about this whole love. I want to read just verse 34 through 35 again. And of course, I close my Bible. John 13. Let me give you a new commandment. Love one another in the same way that I have loved you. You love one another. This is how everyone will recognize you're my disciples. When you see the love, when they see the love that you have for each other. Knowing how Christ has loved us is really, it's really the foundation of what it means to be human. 
and you can't fake it. You either profoundly know the way Christ has loved you, and if you do, it's just going to, it's going to, it's going to come out of every pore in your being. Or you don't get it. And the world really doesn't recognize a difference between a Christian and a non-Christian. The problem, if you don't get it, and most of us on any given day have a hard time getting it, is that the world will condemn Christianity and the world will really condemn Christ when it sees that we don't love the way that we say that Christ loves. Again, or the text, here is the way that everyone out there will know that you have been discipled by me, Jesus says. You have a heart for one another. You love your neighbor. The other thing about it, when we understand it, even a little bit, <laughs> sorry, is that you don't have to work at it really, really hard. Are you working really, really hard to love people? Well, don't be too hard on yourself. Turn back to Jesus. Every single one of us have moments where we realize that we're not loving Jesus very well because we're not loving our neighbor. And those are the moments that we don't need to condemn ourselves. We just need to turn back to the grace and the love of Christ to sit at his feet and then to enjoy the source of love. Just bask in it. Hmm. That kind of basking just leads to this goal of knowing how loved you are, of loving God, and because of that, not can't stop yourself. You want to love your neighbor. So the question that the lawyer asks of Jesus in Luke chapter 10, it's really the question that most of us ask on a regular basis. So who is my neighbor? And our chapter in John says, your neighbor are the church people that you go to church with, the, the fellow Christians. But they're also these resident aliens. Remember back in the Leviticus that you're going to open your field for, that you're going to provide hospitality for, that you're going to care for. How we treat people really matters. Chris Dostom was alive in the 300s. Uh, he was called... Um, he had a, they called him the silver tongue because he could preach so well. And he said this, when a pagan, an outsider, observes in Christians um, that we are attached, that we attack our neighbors more savagely than wild beasts, they call us the plague of the world. These things hold the pagan back and they keep them from coming over to us. He could be writing that today, couldn't he? What is the number one reason that a millennial will tell you they're not in church? It's full of hypocrites. Absolutely. And it's, it's full of, we have to check ourselves all the time and say, okay. We have to hold each other accountable to say, you're not loving well. And I get it because I don't love well sometimes too. But we have to do better because we're loved better than we know. I mean, that was the whole positive reason why so many people joined the church in the earliest years of its inception. Because it was a place where everybody was loved, no matter what their station in life was. I think that in the church, one of the things that's really hard for us is that we think about ourselves denominationally. So instead of thinking about ourselves first as Christ's, we think of ourselves as a Presbyterian or a Catholic or a Methodist or a Baptist or whatever, and it creates those separations and sometimes violent ones in our history. And the rest of the world is just kind of puzzled by this. I think the gift that the millennials give this church, capital T-H-E, capital C-H-U-R-C-H, is that they say, 
Isn't it about Christ? They're not as worried about denominational views as they are about just the person of Jesus Christ. We have to first love one another the way that we have been loved. So that everyone then is our neighbor. Because if you go through the Gospels, you see that Jesus healed everybody. He healed the Jews. He healed the Syrophoenician woman. He healed the Gerizim, the demoniac. He healed them all because he came for all. When we love like that, then we move out into the whole world. And we move out into it because we know the love of God. We, we've tasted the living waters. We've allowed that water to quench the thirst. And you know what a thirst I'm talking about. It's the thirst that nothing else can touch. It's the thirst that makes some people depressed. It's the thirst that makes some people do crazy things for love. It's the thirst that makes others lash out in anger and fear. It's the thirst. And it's the only thirst that can be filled by the quenching and the living waters of Jesus Christ. I want to close by looking at the last verses of John because they're really encouraging to me. Did you catch them? It's Peter again. And it's Peter doing all the things that we do, but we don't want anybody to know what we do. <laughs> it's Peter saying, I'll be faithful to you no matter what. And it's Jesus looking at him and saying, really? No, you won't. But you will lay down your life for me. You see what I'm saying? It's not about being perfect, and it's not about doing it right. You're not going to do it, and I'm not going to do it. But we have a God that loves us so much that he's not worried about whether you do it perfectly. He's just worried about if you love him. Because the rest will take care of itself. Do you love me? That is the love of Christ. It's forgiving. It gives us the benefit of the doubt. It trusts God first and then others. It's verse 35. Here is the love. Here is Christ's love. And it's the way that everyone will know that you have been discipled by me. It's the way you have a heart for one another. And like the good neighbor, it means that Jesus is there. And he's sending us out to share his love. Amen.